Hi there, and welcome to The Artist Craft. I'm your host, Stacy Cochran, and we've got a great guest in studio today, Christopher Irving. Chris is the author of The Blue Beetle Companion and Comics Introspective Volume 1. He serves as an associate editor for the Eisner Award-winning comic book artist magazine and has written for Comics Buyer's Guide, Comic Book Artist, Alter Ego, Back Issue, and Comic Book Marketplace. Christopher, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me along. Well, tell us a little bit about how you got started with comics. What was some of the early interests that you had? Wow. Well, um, I have two older brothers, and comics were very much a pacifier for my parents. Well, pacifier for us through my parents. We had boxes of comic books when I was a kid. Um, but I'd say my interest really, really picked up with the uh, G.I. Joe comic book of the 1980s. Um, but my real real, real catalyst for comics history was um, this book right here, actually, called The Great Comic Book Heroes. And it was that my father gave this to me when I was a kid. Um, came out in the 1960s, written by Jules Pfeiffer, who was an assistant to um, Will Eisner back in the golden age of comics. And it actually reprints many of the, I don't know if you can get that or not, which right here, many of the golden age stories um, back from the 1930s and 40s. And uh, basically what I've been doing um, with this book over the past few years is getting it autographed by the actual artist who did work on each respective story, at least ones who are still alive. Um, but this book did teach me at a young age that there was something before I came around. And I developed this desire to see exactly who these people were and what their stories were. Mm -hmm. Now you have a book here, The Blue Beetle Companion, as well, tell us a little bit about how this book project came together for you. Okay, it's actually rather random. In 1997, I began interviewing comic book writers and artists um, for a series of websites. And along the way, I decided to become a historian, that I really absolutely needed to learn more about the Golden Age itself um, and develop some research chops while I was at it. I learned about the Blue Beetle just in passing. He was um, kind of an obscure character. Um, he has a cult following. But there was a version dating back to 1939, which there was absolutely nothing on. I'd seen little you know, whispers and echoes here and there, a panel reprinted, and said I wanted to learn more about him. So in 1999, I started researching him and the people who did the comic books as well. And eventually, it got to the point where I had enough to pursue a book. And I, I actually did have, I guess it was, um, it's a culmination of eight years worth of research and time and almost an obsession. Um, it culminated in this book that was published by Tumarius Publishing. How would you define the golden age of comic book publishing? I would say it's um, not necessarily golden because it was the best. The golden age of comics cranked out some of the worst looking comic books ever. I mean, <laughs> you had 16 year old kids drawing comics and writing them as well. But it's referred to as the golden age because it really was the strongest period. Um, today we have four major comic book companies. We have DC Comics, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse. Um, roughly in that order, DC and Marvel kind of going neck and neck. Back in the 1930s and 40s when comics began, there were countless publishers, dozens. Um, sales figures for one comic book just far eclipse sales figures today. Um, there was newsstand distribution. There were more than just superhero comics. There was crime, horror. There was, well, by the 50s, there were romance comics as well. Um, true comics, you know, were called Bigfoot comics. It was the time when comics really came out and they just, they mushroomed. They blew up. So now how did the comic book packager, uh, Eisner and Iger, fit into those early years? Okay. Well, Eisner and Iger, um, they were a studio. Well, it, interestingly enough, they were the first non-studio studio in a ways. Will Eisner was a young cartoonist, um, and Iger was someone who um, Will had met through um, a publisher he had worked with briefly. It was called, um, wow, what a comics magazine, I believe is the full title. Um, anyways, Will Eisner wanted to do comics, and he borrowed $15, I believe, from his father to start this business. And Iger had his, um, his name, his second billing, because Will ponied up the money. 
And basically, Iger was the business person. He would go out to different publishers, and a publisher then could be someone literally in a closet um, with a desk and just a name on their door. Usually he, in New York City. Usually, all in New York City, yes. Um, and one, actually, one person who comes to mind was Victor Fox, who was a publisher of The Blue Beetle, um, eventually. Well, Victor Fox is typical of your, your crooked comic book publisher of the 1930s. And um, Fox had Fox Comics, which was literally just one room. That was it. Fox had um, been uh, arrested on embezzlement charges for a boiler room scheme, all types of wonderful crooked things, even before he got into comic books. Uh, we're not talking about what came after, but we're just focusing on before. Well, Will Eisner had just started the studio with Iger. And what Will's idea was, was that he would actually package comic book stories. So he would do, say, an eight-page story that was a knockoff of um, now Dick Tracy, we'll say. And so Will would actually write and draw the entire story. And in many cases, Will would come up with different pseudonyms and draw in different styles so that they could convince Victor Fox, for instance, that they had a full studio of talent. But it was all Will Eisner, one person drawing all of these stories. So anyways, Victor Fox was one of their clients. And Fox hired them to do a story called Wonder Man, which was a man in 19, this was 1930, maybe late 38, early 39. It was a character who could leap buildings. Um, he wore a skin-tight costume. He could destroy tanks with his hands. He could just do all of these incredible feats, very much like Superman, who at that time had only been out for one year and was the first superhero. Um, Eisner and, and Iger were a little reticent about it. Um, but Eisner went ahead and he did the story. And Victor Fox, basically Eisner wrote, penciled and inked the story. They took the final story to Victor Fox, who was the quote-unquote publisher. Victor Fox went ahead and had it printed, distributed, um, and was then promptly sued by DC Comics for infringement upon Superman. Victor Fox at the time, um, being a very crooked individual, didn't want to claim that you know, Wonder Man was his idea. So he told Eisner and Iger that he would not pay them the money that they had earned for, um, by doing Wonder Man unless they actually claimed Wonder Man was their idea. Well, Iger wanted Eisner to, to say, go ahead and say, yeah, Wonder Man was all me. And then, you know, DC couldn't sue Fox. So how did the uh, lawsuit end up between Fox and DC? Well, basically, um, Fox it killed Fox. Um, Eisner went ahead and testified against Fox. He had the proper documentation. And as a result, you know, Eisner's reputation wasn't scorched and Victor Fox's was, which wasn't very difficult. Um, but Fox actually went ahead and no longer needed the services for Eisner and Iger, who essentially got screwed out of their money, and went ahead and um, he did hire a bullpen, um, a staff, and became Fox Comics. So he bounced back then after. Well, yeah, he, he kind of did. And, and his, um, OK, there's a legend about Victor Fox. <laughs> and I'll keep this short, because I could go on forever. But apparently, Fox's studios were in the same building as DC just a higher floor. Rumor has it that when the elevator stopped at DC's floor, which was then known as National Comics, Victor Fox would spit out the elevator <laughs> and keep riding it up. Um, but he was determined to make um, DC Comics pay. And so he did everything he could to compete with them, a part of which was the Blue Beetle, which was um, originally a Green Hornet ripoff. Green Hornet was you know, the old uh, radio hero who later became a TV star for one year. and. Um, he kind of took Green Hornet and retooled him into um, what was basically their competition for.